Well, good morning. <clears throat> it almost feels strange to be back here preaching after our staff pastors have so capably and ably fulfilled this pulpit. As Mike said, we're in chapter 2 of Colossians, and I want us to begin reading from verse 6, if you will, and through verse 15. However, we're not going to complete the whole passage. I'm going to do this in a two-part series, so we're going to finish this morning in verse 10. So listen along as Paul writes to the Colossians. Verse 6, So then, just as you received... Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can see those verses are just absolutely packed. And so rather than trying to race through them, I decided to cut the passage in half and do part one and part two. So this morning, we're going to just do these first five verses. Last week, if you were here with us, you'll remember what some of the things that Andrew shared with us. He taught us that our gospel witness, this is important, our gospel witness was through our gospel living. Does that make sense? Who we are, who we're becoming, is a tremendous testimony, has a tremendous impact on those people around us who are not yet saved. We all have all these spheres of influence, don't we? Our neighbors, family members, friends, uh, relatives, people we work with, people we go to school with. We all have these spheres of influence. And once you're known as a Christian, people watch you, don't they? And how you live your life is really your loudest testimony. And it provides a basis, it provides a, a platform, if you will, for people to want to listen to you because your life has been credible to them as they've observed you. Living a strong life of faith simply issues in a strong and clear witness to those people and to those lives that have not yet come to hear the good news or to grasp the good news. And this strong life of faith ensures that you and I will persevere in the faith. We will not fall away. It's imperative that we don't become lax in how we live our Christian life. Are you with me? How many parents do we have? How many would like to think of themselves as loving parents? (laughs) Of course. Of course. I had a conversation with a man this week who... uh, we hadn't talked in years and we managed to catch up and he has five grown children and he was catching me up on, on his children and where they were, what they were doing. And, and in the midst of our, of our visit, he shared with me that he had prayed over his children that God would give them a strong, strong faith like his. And then he said, but then God spoke to me 
And God said, why don't you pray for them that God would give them a faith that surpasses yours? And he went on to share with me that all five of his kids came to Christ at an early age. And they're all strong, strong Christians. And he was so pleased to be able to share with me. And I, I've known them over the years and uh, to, to realize and to hear how they have grown and matured and what part they're playing in the kingdom of God actively so was a tremendous blessing, as you might imagine. So like loving parents that, that have goals for their children, and if you are a loving parent, you do have goals for your children. Similarly, Paul has goals for the church. And if you reflect back on the things that uh, Andrew shared with us last week, Paul desires that the Colossians, if you look with me at verses 2 through 4 again, just read with me. He says, my purpose, my goals for you, is that you may be strengthened in heart, united in love, so you may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that you may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. So in that passage, he desired that the Colossians, and by extension, you and I, as as Christians 2,000 years later, He desired that we be encouraged in heart, strong in heart, not weak, not wimpy. That we be united in what? Love. Not warring against each other, but rather united in love so that we may have more and more the full riches of understanding to know Christ. I'm always amazed In the letter, Paul's letter to the Philippian church, in chapter 3, how he says this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I thought to myself, as I read that a long time ago, I thought, well, he already knows Christ. I mean, gosh, it's the end of his life. He's in prison. He's going to have his head lopped off. And here he's saying, I want to know Christ. You can never know Christ enough. You can never know him enough. Don't ever be satisfied. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. If that's your only prayer, so be it. He'll answer that prayer. He goes on and he says that they not be led astray, that you and I also may not be led astray or deceived by fine-sounding arguments. Arguments that, that seem reasonable, seem logical. Seems, you, you could easily be taken in by them if you don't know better. And then he says, I desire that you be confident. I think this is key. Be confident that Jesus Christ is all you need. He's all you need. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter writes this, much akin to what Paul is saying here. He says, his, meaning God's divine power, has given us most things that we need for life and godliness, right? No, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises that through them you may, I love this, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Jesus is all we need. He is all we need. Now we may nod our heads and say, yeah, I I believe that. But, But do you live your life as if the reality is true? He's all I need. He's all I need. Do we have any desire for acceptance? Oh, yeah. We will do anything and everything necessary to be accepted, won't we? Or at least to avoid not being accepted. I mean, we'll go to the great lengths. We'll do our little dance. We'll put on our pretenses. Just, I just want you to accept me. 
Acceptance. We have total acceptance in guess who? In Jesus, that's right. How about love? Is love an important dynamic? Totally loved. Totally loved. Pastor, no one loves me. Shut up. (laughs) God loves you. God loves you. How about approval? Oh, yeah. We all want to be approved. I want my mommy to approve me. I want my daddy to approve of me. You may not articulate that, but down deep inside, there's this longing for approval. I'm okay. How about forgiveness? Yeah, we stuff stuff way down. We don't want to acknowledge it. We don't want to acknowledge necessarily our need for forgiveness. But in Christ, we have total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. John reminds us that when we sin, we can confess our sins. He never tells us to beg for forgiveness. He says, confess it, admit to it. And be confident that God is faithful and just to what? Forgive you and what? Cleanse you from all the attendant unrighteousness. Freedom, approval, acceptance, forgiveness, newness, newness. There isn't a single one of us that doesn't look past in, in our life and, 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 and have some regrets. Isn't that true? We go, oh, man. Oh, bummer, bummer, bummer. And yet Jesus offers us what? Newness of life. Healing, a sense of worth, a sense of purpose, joy, hope. As Christians, we live hopeful lives. That means not a a weak sense of wishing. It means confident. I'm confident in him. Peace, freedom. There isn't a single one of us that doesn't want to have have the sense of freedom. I'm free. I am free. He set me free. He's broken the chains that have bound me. I am free. He's all I need. He is all I need. He is all I need. And as a result of understanding and realizing that, Paul goes on in that passage to say that our lives should overflow with a deep sense of gratitude. Thankful hearts without which, I submit to you, we are especially vulnerable to doubt and to spiritual delusion. Imperative, we give thanks always. In all things, for all things. We're, we're a thankful people. We're a hopeful people. Because once we give up on giving thanks, we're subject to spiritual delusion. The enemy can get a foothold in your life. If you don't understand how important being thankful is, understand this. Doubt will come creeping in. Doubt. And once doubt creeps in and gets a foothold, you're dead in the water. You're dead in the water. Rather than that, what what should we be doing? Realizing Christ is our sufficiency, and we should, what, every day just be giving thanks. Thank you that you're all I need. Thank you that you're all I need. Can you tell I believe this stuff? (laughs) Now, verse 6 in our passage begins with this. He says, so then, therefore, depending on which translation you're reading from. It's like a hinge word. It's like the the gate is going to turn on this. He's, He's stated his case. He says, now, so then, therefore. So building on what he said in the first five verses of of this passage in other words his purpose for them and that 
purpose is all the things we describe. He says, so then, continue. Continue to walk in him. Continue to live in him. Living in union with Christ Jesus means simply maintaining that lifestyle patterned after his. John says this to us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Must. You, you can't not. Why? Because as a born-again Christian, as a new creation, you have been given a brand new spiritual nature. Do you know that? Prior to becoming a Christian, we had a human sinful nature that had a bent away from God, a bent towards sin, a bent towards selfishness, a bent towards pride, a bent towards the kingdom of darkness. Once you're born again, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, you are a what? New creation. All this has passed away. So now I have a bent towards him. I have a, a, a new nature. And whatever nature I have determines my appetite. Are you with me? So an old nature has a certain appetite. Appetite for worldly things. Appetite for this life only. Appetite for godlessness. A new nature has an appetite for what? For God and the things of God. And it's a, it's a miracle that God does this for us. And so if you profess to be a Christian... It ought to show. <laughs> it ought to show. It ought to show. You're it all perplexed in, in, a, in a given situation, but what to do, how to walk like Jesus. Just ask yourself, what would Jesus do in this situation? And if you still don't know, go search his word. Don't take a step until you know what he would do. This is why it's imperative to be a student of the Bible. Would you agree? Yes. So Paul is telling us we are like a tree with deep roots in rich soil. We have been rooted in him. We've been rooted in him. That took place when? At salvation. When you and I got saved, we were rooted in him. Deep roots. Just like in the video, we saw the, the Joshua tree roots go way, 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 way down to get the moisture so they can still live. This takes place at salvation. Jesus Christ is the source of our spiritual nourishment, our spiritual growth, and our fruitfulness. He's the source. We don't generate it on our own. You're rooted and grounded in him. How many remember what John said in his gospel in chapter 15? Remember the parable that Jesus taught? The parable of the what? Of the vine and the branches, right? He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And the picture of intimate union and apart, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So separate from him, you cut the branch off. The branch just dies. So we are united in him, rooted, and we continue to walk in. Again, he is all we need. And as we continue this walk of faith in Jesus, we are built up in him. Who does the building up, do you think? He does. All he wants us to do is pay attention. All he wants us to do is to trust him. All he wants us to do is to continue to walk with him. And as we do so, he builds us up. I don't build myself up. You don't build yourself up. But we are physically and humanly want to do that, huh? We want to build ourselves up. We want to accredit ourselves. You can't. He builds us up so that we become more and more like him. Only God can do that. In the book of Acts, in chapter 20, when Paul is addressing the Ephesian elders, his farewell address, it's a fairly familiar passage to most of us. And he's, he's weeping over it. He's just going to miss these guys. He says to them, I commit you. 
I commit you to God and what else? The word of his grace, which is able to do what? Build you up and grant you that inheritance that he has for all his saints. Does the word of God have any part in this building up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Peter tells us as we spend time with God in his word and he talks to us through his word and we listen to his word and we take his word in, Peter says that we will grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, You want to know Christ? Read his book. Read his book. Read his book. And Paul again in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 says we will become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Wow. Wow. All I need is him. All I need is him. In verse 7 of our passage, he talks about being strengthened, established in the faith. And again, this is something that God does. He strengthens us. He establishes us. Our part is to expose ourselves. Our part is to trust him. Our part is to walk with him. Who wants to live a healthy Christian life? Let me try that again. Who wants to live a healthy Christian life? (laughs) You should raise your hand if you're sitting here this morning. (laughs) Part of sitting here, part of coming is because I want to live a healthy Christian life, right? Yeah. And having this firm foundation that Christ or that Paul has described to the Colossians is absolutely imperative if we're to live a healthy, wholesome Christian life. It should go without saying, but we need to say it. Believers who are rooted and built up and strengthened and established in their faith will overflow with something. What will they be overflowing with? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. A grateful heart to God for all that he has done, all that he has done and the fact that he will continue to work in us. I submit to you a grateful heart will strengthen our grip on the truth and we won't be vulnerable to doubt and or spiritual delusion. You, you, you just walk around like a delirious Christian <laughs> giving thanks all the time. God, thank you, 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 thank you. You don't even have to be specific. A thankful heart, a thankful spirit, a thankful attitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Try that. From early in... In man's history, early on, mankind, man, has pondered questions. Questions we could describe as questions of ultimate reality. It's like, one of them is, where did this all come from? Where did this all come from? Over the years, obviously I have, and probably you have too, Talk to people and say, well, is it the Big Bang? I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but if I'll give you a Big Bang, I want you to tell me what went bang and how did it get there? You have to keep pushing back, pushing back to ultimate reality, ultimate cause. Who am I? Who am I? People, people ponder that. Philosophers, religionists, over eons of time have pondered these questions. I read a story about the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Some of you recognize that name. And the the story goes on to say that he loved to take long walks on summer evenings to meditate and to think. On one occasion, he was sitting in a park when a policeman noticed that he had been there for several hours. The policeman came up to him and said, what are you doing? And Kant answered, I'm thinking. 
And the policeman said, who are you? Kant replied, that's precisely the problem I've been thinking about. (laughs) Who am I? Why am I here? What's this all about? Where am I going? What happens when I die? Is there really anything right and or wrong? Is there such a thing as morality? Of course, in our culture today, that's a non-issue. There's no morality in our culture today. But what I want to suggest is, is, is every religion ever devised by man, every philosophy ever devised by man has in its own limited way tried to answer those questions. They're basic questions of life. Most of the world's philosophers, most of the world's religionists will deny, one, the existence of God, or if they don't do that, then they will hold an unbiblical view of who God is. And all you have to do is talk to these people. And over the years, I've talked to a number of them. I said, well, I, I asked them, do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well tell, me, tell me about God. Well, you know, the big guy. Up there, number one. What about him? Tell me what he's like. Or she. I had one guy say, you, don't, don't you want me to tell me what she's like? I thought at that point, this is, this is a joke. Most people today and throughout the history of man are what we know as deists. Now, if you've never heard that term, you don't know what a deist is. A deist is a person who does believe in God. But the emphasis of their life, the system of thought that they hold, emphasizes morality. Simply morality. You must be a good person. You must be a moral person. When you hear that from somebody, that automatically alerts you that that person's a deist. They don't believe in a personal God who's involved because a deist thinks and believes that, yes, God is a creator. He created everything, and then he walked away. Whoops, there goes my tea. He walked away to leave us to our own devices. He doesn't intervene. He's not involved. He doesn't even care. That's what a deist is. Does that sound like people who have hope? No, no. And the other major arena of belief about God is pantheism. Pantheism is a system of belief that simply equates God with the forces of nature. Or is a worship of all gods. All gods are equivalent. They're all equipped. They're all, you can, one is as good as another. There were religionists and philosophers in Colossae, as there are in every community where people gather. And the church in Colossae faced the danger of being infiltrated by false teaching. The false teaching as is present even today. We have false teachers everywhere. I mean, you've got them on the internet, you've got them on the television, you've got them everywhere, YouTube and all that sort of stuff. It's a good thing I don't own a computer and I don't watch YouTube because I don't want to expose myself to all that false teaching. I just move along with my, my Bible. Now, the specific false teaching in Colossae that Paul is addressing He doesn't name it. But if you read down through verses 8 through 23, it contains elements of philosophy. It contains elements of legalism, mysticism, asceticism, and Gnosticism. But most damning was its teaching that Jesus was neither God nor the source of all truth. An attack on his deity, and an attack on his sufficiency. That's the heart of this particular passage. Look at verse 9 with me in our passage. 
He says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He says it right there. There is that testimony. Indisputable. Jesus is God in the flesh. Kind of as a side note, there, there are two issues, I think, that are important to know about cults and false religions and false philosophies. Sometimes we labor, like I have to know everything the Mormons believe. I have to know everything the Jehovah's Witness. I have to believe all this. I have to know all this stuff to be able to talk to them. No, you don't. No, you don't. You need only to understand and know two things. All these false religions, all these cults, all these philosophers, one, they deny the deity of Christ. I just ask them, who do you say Jesus is? <laughs> and they go on this long story, and I'm listening for, he is God in the flesh. No. The second thing that we need to know and realize, not necessarily all the stuff that they believe, but the fact that they don't believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone. No. No. Salvation is based on moral goodness, on works. Catholicism as a whole, Mormonism as a whole, Jehovah's Witnesses as a whole, and you go all the way down the line, and all these religious groups, sincerely religious people, but they base their relationship with God on their own goodness. Just ask anybody. Ask anybody on the street you meet. If you died today, what would happen to you? Well, I, I, I hope I'd go to heaven. Why? Why? Well, because I'm a pretty decent person. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's right there. Rarely, unless you bump into a Christian, rarely you're going to hear, because Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I put my full confidence in him. Whoa, yo, whoa, that is a great answer. That is the answer. <laughs> True? <laughs> Paul reminds us, church constantly faces the danger of false teachers. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. You see that? <laughs> he says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ferocious wolves. Look how Jesus characterizes them. Ferocious wolves. Look with me at Acts chapter 20. This again is Paul in his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. He says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves, listen to the language he uses. Savage wolves will come in among you, will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your what? Be on your guard. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, <laughs> those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Being a mutilator of flesh means that they're talking about circumcision as a necessity to be saved. Paul is concerned that those Colossians who have been rescued from the do domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of God's son whom he loves, verse 13 of chapter 1, if you recall, he's concerned that they not be enslaved again. Every pastor has that concern for his flock, that they press on in the faith, why? So they're not enslaved once again by some false teaching, false doctrine. False people who come along and want to scoop you up. He says to them, see to it. See to it. Pay attention. Be on constant watch that no one takes you captive. To Paul, it was absolutely unthinkable that those who had been rescued and redeemed should be vulnerable by ignorance and become prisoners of some spiritual predator 
with false doctrine. One of the primary responsibilities of an elder, a pastor, an overseer, one of the primary responsibilities is to guard the flock against those savage wolves, as Paul described, those perverse people who will assault a flock in an effort to spiritually kidnap them. How does Paul identify the means of spiritual kidnap? What does he, what does he call it? Hollow and deceptive philosophy. Hollow and deceptive philosophy. I simply refer to it as flavored sawdust. <laughs> Tastes good, but there's nothing there that nourishes us. Hollow and deceptive, that's the means by which Christians can be kidnapped. Something may sound good. Something may sound sound, if you will. But it's not necessarily what it appears to be. There are all sorts of spiritual tricksters, spiritual hucksters out there. But there's no value in their philosophical speculations, no matter how deeply and profoundly religious they sound. That's why it's imperative to be involved in a good Bible teaching church. You go to a church, you want to go to a church that teaches the Bible, that walks you verse by verse by verse, as we have been wont to do since our very inception 50 years ago. But not just in coming to church. There's a necessary supplement to coming to the church. What's that? Mini church, that's right. Because you'll leave here today. And I promise you, tomorrow, if I run into you on the street, I say, what did you hear yesterday? Um, what did I hear? We need, we need reinforcement. This is why mini church is so critically vital to your spiritual well-being. I want to tell you, if you're not in mini church, you need to be in a mini church. You need that fellowship, you need that accountability, and you need to rehearse what you heard on the weekend, lest you forget it. And most of us do. Most of us can just get kind of fuzzy. It's good to be reminded, amen? How many know that I have a ministry of reminding? <laughs> That's right. Now, Paul gives us two sources he gives us two sources for hollow and deceptive philosophy. The first one, human tradition. And the second one, the basic principles of this world. Human tradition. Simply nothing more than that which is passed from one person to another. Human tradition. I was often, always thought this, this story was so cute. Um, and maybe you've heard this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. A young, young, young girl was watching her mother prepare the Easter ham. Have you heard this? She's watching her mother prepare the Easter ham. So she watches, and the mother cuts the end off the, off the ham and puts it in the oven. She says, Mom, why, why did you cut the end off the Easter ham? Well... I always watched my mother. My mother always caught, cut the end off the ham before she put it in the oven. Why? Well, I don't really know. Well, let's call and find out. So they called the grandmother, the mother's mother. I said, why, why did you always cut the end off the ham before you put it in the oven? The grandmother said, well, because my mother always did that. <laughs> now, the great-grandmother was still alive, so they called the great-grandmother. Great-grandma, why did you cut the end off the ham before you put it in the oven? Well, I just didn't have a pan big enough for it. <laughs> <laughs> do you see how we just kind of do things and believe things, tradition, things are handed down to us, and we just 
do them, right? We just believe them. Human tradition. Just because people have believed something and handed it down through the years doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true. Mom, why do we believe this? Dad, why do we believe this? You want to teach your children to ask these questions. If you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, and God it, it tells Moses, you want your kids to ask these questions. You want to give them the answers. Why do we do this? Tradition usually serves only to perpetuate error. Philosophical, psychological systems and theories perpetuate the false belief that man is basically what? Good. We're basically, it's just, it's just our parents have screwed us up. Life, the world has screwed us up. We're basically good. That's what psychology teaches. That's what man's philosophy teaches us. What does the Bible teach us? <laughs> Man is not basically good. Most of you know that I, I'm fond of watching Hallmark movies. They're sappy, predictable. People, when I tell them that they roll their eyes at me, but, you know, I'm just the Hallmark kind of guy. And invariably, when you watch those movies, you'll hear this. When someone's reaching a point of dilemma, just follow your heart. (laughs) No! No! Don't follow your heart. Your heart is desperately sick. It's wicked. Don't follow your heart. My gosh. You may or may not be aware of it, but in the field of psychological theories, there are over 500 competing theories about how one should live their life. It's like one person draws a circle and says, live within this circle, you'll be fine. Next guy comes along and says, no, 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 live within this circle. Then the next guy comes along and says, no, live in this circle. How do you know? I'm going to submit to you there's only one circle you want to live in. Jesus. First century Judaism. First century Judaism. There's another example of the effects of tradition. The Jewish teachers, the Jewish uh, leaders had overlaid the word of God with so many customs, so many rules, so many traditions and rituals and teachings that the word of God became literally indistinguishable. Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Listen, listen to Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples, uh, you have to love this, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? <laughs> that ought to blow your mind. What a, what a monumental question. To which Jesus responds, You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Peter, in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, he writes to the Gentile believers and he says, he, he speaks to them about the empty way of life handed down from your forefathers. What have we learned from our patriarchs? What have we learned from our forefathers? What have we learned from people who have gone before us? Have they taught us the word of God? What have they taught us? What have they handed down to us? What traditions in our own modern day? You know evolution is taught as scientific fact. There's no basis for that whatsoever in science. It's taught as a religious idea. And along with it, the false notion that this is what scientists have always believed. No, they have not. No, they have not. In all these examples, 
Tradition was and is nothing more than ignorance and falsehood handed down from generation to generation, the tradition of men, not the tradition of God, which is the only source of truth. The second source for these hollow and deceptive philosophies he describes as the basic principles of this world. Now, that's a very interesting description because the word that's translated basic principles is a word that originally, in its original original uh, meaning, uh, simply denoted the letters of the alphabet. In other words, its root meaning was things in order. A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what the word originally meant. Then the term came to be used of the elements of learning. We talk about the ABCs of learning, don't we? These are the elements of living. So again, this idea of things in order. And then it, that word meant to was, took on the understanding and the meaning of the physical elements of the world and even the stars and other heavenly bodies. But then... It also absorbed the meaning of elemental spirits. Elemental spirits. In other words, the supernatural powers believed by many of the ancient Near Eastern people to preside over and to direct the heavenly bodies. The sense here in our passage, I think, may mean either the basic elements of learning or the elemental spirits. Now hang with me here. If it's the first, if it's the basic elements of learning, then the whole statement means that the philosophy Paul is referring to was really only rudimentary instruction, just the basics of instruction, not advanced theology, doctrine, heavenly thoughts, and so forth. But, if we were to understand the basic principle of this world as elemental spirits, then the reference means either that the philosophy was a system instigated by elemental spirits. In fact, Paul does tell Timothy that some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and doctrines taught by demons. Or, it was a system having elemental spirits as its subject matter. I tend to believe that. I think that the meaning is probably what Paul means in verse 18, because in verse 18 he references the worship of angels. So I think that when he's talking about these elemental spirits, he's talking about doctrines that talk about the worship of angels. He tells us, that any and every philosophy not finding its basis in Jesus Christ is simply hollow and deceptive. Jesus is the standard. He's the standard by which every philosophy, every theory, every doctrine is to be measured in any system. Whatever it claims must be rejected if it fails to conform to what the Bible teaches and what God has given us in him. In our last two verses, verses 9 and 10, they, these verses present us with this glorious majesty of Jesus Christ and his complete and total sufficiency. Again, verse 9, as we read earlier, is a definitive statement of his deity. He is God in the flesh. Those people who promote the false teaching will always deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. But Paul tells us all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In Christ. And every true born again believer, every true born again believer has been given what? Fullness in Christ. Fullness. All those qualities and characteristics that we talked about earlier on in, in our time together this morning. Fullness in Christ, meaning in this vital union with Him. He's the vine, I'm the branch. 
Everything that's true of him is true of me. I have the fullness of everything. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3 of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3 chronicles what event? What tragic event? It's called the fall of man. Man originally was created perfectly in a perfect state of untested righteousness. So the test would come in chapter 3. He's created in such a way that he is complete. And he falls. That's why it's called the fall of man. He falls from the state of perfection and righteousness to a state of imperfection, unrighteousness, sinfulness, incompleteness. We were originally made complete in his image. No flaw. Nothing at all. No hint of sin, evil. But then as a result of the fall, we became spiritually incomplete. Totally out of relationship with God. And that spiritual incompleteness leads to moral incompleteness. Morally, we are incomplete. But it doesn't end there. We are intellectually incomplete. Incomplete in our thoughts and understanding and on our mild. We do not know the truth. The truth has to be revealed to us. Our eyes have to be opened to the truth. How many have experienced that? You know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden you go, whoa, how long has this been around? At salvation, Peter tells us, we become participants, partakers of the divine nature. Wrap your mind around that. Well, I don't feel like it, but you are. This is true of you. You may not feel like it. But it's true. At salvation, we are regenerated. Or to use Jesus' words, born again. We're made new creations, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As I mentioned earlier, as a new creation, you have a brand new appetite. (laughs) You ought to look at your life and say... What am, I, what am I hungering after? What am I hungering after? If it's not God and the things of God more and more and more, I have a reason to question, in fact, am I born again? Have I actually been regenerated? Or am I playing a religious game? Am I just going along with the crowd? Am I, I like these people, I want to be social with them, but I'm really outside. Am I making sense? We've been made complete spiritually. We've been made complete morally. we made complete intellectually. Again, let me remind you of Peter's words. Through God's power, we have been granted everything we need for life and godliness. God hasn't cheated us. He's not left anything out on us. Like he said to Eve in the garden, has God really said? He's holding out on you, you know. He knows that when you eat of it, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. Ooh, is knowing evil a desirable thing? No. Makes it sound like it, huh? If you are a true born-again believer, you are complete in your union with Christ. You do not need the teachings of any guru, any false teacher, or any cult. You don't need to look around for something more fanciful. You got it right here. Right here. God provides. Everyone has a choice. Everyone has a choice, whether to follow human wisdom or to come to Jesus. Everyone has a choice. Jesus says it. Whoever will come, I'll not cast away. John writes, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that what whoever would believe in him would not perish all the whoever's you read about them in John's gospel everyone has a choice 
to follow the wisdom of the world, be taken captive, to be kidnapped by the emissaries of Satan, or to follow Jesus. You want to be left spiritually incomplete or spiritually complete? Hmm, spiritually incomplete, spiritually complete. Let me weigh those. <laughs> what do you think, Brendan? Huh? Spiritually complete, amen, brother. You got it. To come to Christ. And if you have not, you can make a decision right there where you're sitting. But to come to Christ is to come to the one who alone offers completeness, fullness, wholeness, and life, and life abundant. Jesus Christ is all and all we need. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you that you are all we need. Thank you for your amazing grace and the love you have for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the people who teach us your word and share your word with us. Thank you that we can read it for ourselves and that your Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Stir us up, O God. Remind us of who you are. I pray that our hearts, as we meditate on these things, would indeed overflow with gratitude. That our lives be marked not only by hope, but by thankfulness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.